Great, thank you, Zach. Um, as he just said, my name is Emily. I'm from the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. I'm also an Eco AmeriCorps member. Um, if you're not familiar with the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, it's a nonprofit environmental research organization that relies heavily on citizen science for a lot of our programs. So if you have any interest in um, citizen science or learning more about us, I highly encourage you to check out our website. Um, and iNaturalist is one of the tools that we use on a regular basis as a way to both collect data and also um, uh, recruit citizen scientists and get more involved. So we're going to be starting with that today. And I'll share my screen here and we'll get started. So first, a little overview. We're going to be started. Um, we're going to be starting out talking about um, the basics of iNaturalist, including making your first observations. So if you're a new user, this is the section for you. We'll really go over what it is and how to get started. Um, and then after a break for some questions, Zach's going to take a deeper dive into learning how to use additional features on the website to strengthen your observations, and also talk more about the big picture and how iNaturalist data are used in conservation. But before we get into all that, I first want to start with a spider. And this isn't just any spider, it's a black palped jumping spider. And it was discovered by a UVM wildlife biology undergraduate student in the summer of 2019. Um, and you may be wondering what's so exciting and special about this spider. Well, so this spider was actually the first record of this species for Vermont. It's an introduced species um, and the student had seen it, he had taken a picture of it and he had posted that picture on iNaturalist where from there scientists had, um, had seen it and confirmed that it was actually the first record of the species for the state. Um, and the reason why I'm telling you this is because it highlights one of the many reasons why iNaturalist is such a great tool to use. Because if the student hadn't uploaded this photo, who knows when we may, may have discovered that this spider was in the state. Vermont is, even if it's a small state, it's still a relatively large area, and this is a pretty small spider. So we could have gone an additional few years without realizing it's here, and that's important when trying to monitor other introduced and invasive species, both in Vermont and in other states and countries around the world. So first we should talk a little bit about what citizen science is. I'm sure a lot of you already know it, what it is, but just in case there are some people to whom this is a familiar, unfamiliar term, um, iNaturalist is generally understood as the public involvement in the collection of scientific data. And there are many different um, areas of study that are covered under citizen science, everything from astronomy to microbiology, um, ecology, everything in between. And there's also a range of intensities of citizen science projects. There are crowdsourced citizen science projects like iNaturalist where you don't really have a set um, person guiding the project. Um, it's very broad, you can do it on your own time. There aren't a whole lot of guidelines. And then there are also more site-specific projects that are more rigorous. They have a time and a place and generally have one or two people directing you and you have to follow a, a specific set of methods. And so um, that's a different type of project. Those are different type of projects that we won't talk about today, but they're still important to know about because citizen science covers a very broad range of the scientific field. So what is iNaturalist more specifically? It began as a grad student project at the University of California, Berkeley in 2008, and was later um, joined by the California Academy of Sciences and National Geographic to provide extra support and funding. At this point, iNaturalist is nearly 1 million naturalists strong with experts in a vast array of fields who will help out and confirm and check identifications on the site. Um, it documents a vast array of species and their ranges and distributions and can ultimately help contribute to understanding how species respond to climate change, how invasive species might travel in an area, and how cities and land trusts might be able to better conserve and protect lands around them. So the good news is, is that iNaturalist is free. It's available on all your devices. You can use it on your smartphone, on your laptop, on your desktop computer, on your iPad or tablet. Um, it's a great tool for teachers, although um, the important thing to know is that anyone who's younger than 13 years of age does need parental permission to use it. Um, but otherwise, it's a great way to 
um, connect with others and learn more about the natural world around you is an, and is a very accessible tool. So iNaturalist uses something called artificial intelligence to uh, make identifications in the field. So this is the function that allows you to take a picture and have it almost immediately give you a guess as to what it thinks it is. But artificial intelligence is a really broad field. And if you're like me, you might not know what it, what it is. I didn't know what it was until a couple months ago when I actually started learning about it to better understand iNaturalist. So real quick, we're going to run through a quick um, demonstration of how iNaturalist's artificial intelligence works. And in order to do that, I'm going to show you four different photos. And for each photo, I want you to look at the label that's attached to it. You can see over here, it says Lobush Blueberry. And I just want you either in your mind or to shout out in the chat. Um, one thing you notice about this about the pictures that I'm gonna show you. And I'm gonna go through these fairly fast. Um, so just the first thing that comes to mind. So I'll give you a few seconds with this one. And now to this one, anything you notice about the plant, the color of the berries, the shape of the leaves. And something you notice about this plant, notice the label has changed. This is now black raspberry. And the final picture, anything about the leaves, or the shape of the berries. Now I know this was pretty fast, but keeping in mind some of those features that you observed from the previous one, I'm gonna give you about 10 seconds, 10, 15 seconds to shout out in the chat what you think this plant might be. Okay, so if you've had a few seconds to think about it, we're gonna go to the big reveal. It is a low bush blueberry. And so the reason why I did this sort of silly exercise is because this in a very simple way mimics how iNaturalist uses artificial intelligence to be able to help you identify your photos. So what iNaturalist will do is it'll take a whole bunch of photos that have been labeled. As you see, this one has a label up here and it looks for different traits in each of the photos with that same label. And then once it has all those traits compiled with the labels, when it then receives an unlabeled picture, say this one, it can use those traits that it is already familiar with to then make a guess at what it thinks the photo is of. And of course, this isn't perfect. It does make mistakes sometimes, but it's surprisingly accurate. Um, and if you're already a user or if you plan on becoming one, you'll quickly see that um, it's, it's, usually, um, it's usually right. So there are a lot of different ways you can use iNaturalist. Personally, the main reason why I got into it is to keep track of all the different species I was seeing when out in the woods and out in the fields. Um, these are just a couple different observations I've made over the, um, over the past few months. Um, and it's a, great, it's a great tool for keeping track of what you've seen. For example, on a hike the other weekend, I saw a moose. And if I wanted to know a year from now where I saw that moose, or what date I saw it, um, I'd be able to go back into my records, into my iNaturalist observations, be able to see exactly when and where I was when I saw that moose. And so it's a great tool for basically being able to document your nature discoveries and keep track of them and being able to show them and share them with other people. Another great way to use it is to identify things. So I talked about the artificial intelligence a moment ago. And basically that will give you guesses like this. It'll say, here's this moth. We think it's in this genus. There's all these species that we're lifting off and genus and species are just different categories that are used to organize, um, to organize different forms of life. Um, and so we're, it, it provides all these, but then once it makes those initial um, guesses, other users can come on and help you. I often say using iNaturalist is like carrying a small biologist around in your pocket, but without the lectures. Um, you'll get a whole bunch of people chiming in, helping you make identifications. And then through that, you'll get more acquainted with the species that you might see out in the woods or the fields all the time, but you just don't know what they're called. Um, and so for me, that's been another valuable tool is being able to become more familiar and being able to identify things better. Another great reason to use it, it's not just great for learning how to identify things, but it's also great for knowing 
more about a species in general. There are some pretty cool pages called taxa info pages that exist for each species. And these pages have different pieces of information on them about the species. So in the example here, I used a yellow trout lily. You'll see it has this nice picture of a yellow trout lily. Um, these are a bunch of other pictures down here you can click through so you can see different examples of what it looks like. Uh, and there's also this set of graphs over here. And so by looking at these graphs, I can learn different things about the observations that have been made about this plan. For example, with seasonality, I can see the number of observations that have been seen each month over a year. For history, I can see the number of observations made over a series of years. And uh, for sex, I can see the ratio of male and female observations for this plant. And finally, plant phenology, which is pretty cool and is really helpful this time of year, it shows me the number of observations of plants that are flowering, fruiting, or budding. So with those black raspberries you saw on the previous slide a few minutes ago, if you looked at its page, you might be able to see when the black raspberries around your neighborhood are, fr are fruiting. Another great use for it um, is finding out a species conservation status. So for example, yellow trout lilies are pretty common here in Vermont, at least I feel like I see them a lot. However, I know then if I went to Illinois, they'd actually be considered rare, which is really interesting. Um, it'll show you the taxono taxonomy of the, the species that you're looking at. So um, I'll know what other plants a yellow trout lily might be closely related to. And finally, I'll show you this cool map. And each of these little green circles is a single observation. So you know that all the observations for this plant are made in this section of the United States, the eastern section. So if you went to the west coast, you probably wouldn't see any yellow trout lilies. Another great way to use it, which Zach will get into more later, is for projects and contributing your data to um, to uh, larger groups who are trying to learn more about either an area or a specific set of species. For example, at um, the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, we have the Vermont Atlas of Life, which is trying to document the species that are located in Vermont. And we have another project called the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas, which will be running this summer, where we're trying to learn more about the lady beetle species that are in Vermont and try to discover the missing species that haven't been seen since the 1970s. One final way you can use it is for places. And places is an interesting function because you can see all the observations and all the species that have been seen for a specific location. So for example, this is um, Fort Dummer State Park down in Brattleboro, Vermont. And you can see these are all different observations that people have made of species in this area. And so if you went for a hike here, you would know if you wanted to try to survey an area that no one's been to, you could go to this block here where there aren't any observations. Or if you wanted to see a specific plant, you could try to look at where it is located on this map and then go to that place. So it's really useful for those reasons. It's also really useful for conservation professionals who might be more interested in learning about the species located in a specific region um, of the land that they oversee. So now that I've talked a bit about what iNaturalist is and what it can do, it's important to know how to use it. And so for this, I'm going to be going through two examples side by side, because since you can use your iNaturalist on your computer or your smartphone, um, you can, it's important to know how to do each one. Um, and the, for the smartphone version, it was taken um, using my Android. So for iPhone users, it'll look slightly different, but most of the functions are the same. Um, and I will po point out here that all the functions that I've talked about before now, those are all functions that you'd use on your computer. The computer version of iNaturalist, the website, is much more robust. However, both the, web, the uh, website and the app are good for uploading observations. So the two examples I'll be using here are an American mink and a pile of snakes I saw while hiking in the White Mountains. So the first step for recording an observation is to click either the Upload button or the Add Observations button on your computer, or this green circle or a similar looking button on your iPhone um, on your smartphone to get started. And so once you click either of these buttons, um, you'll get brought to a page that says um, you can either take a photo or you can upload a photo from um, your files. And, or you can use no photo, but I highly recommend that you do use a photo. Um, so once you choose your photo, you'll get to a page that looks like this. And as you can see, um, for my 
smartphone version, my date and location are blank. For most people, this won't be the case. This will fill in automatically. For some reason on my phone, it doesn't. Um, in your computer version, you'll notice that it gave me the date. However, it did not give me the location. And so this will happen um, oftentimes if you're shooting with a, uh, a camera and your location isn't enabled. Um, and a lot of people don't do this because using your GPS on your camera can really drain the battery. Um, so a lot of people choose not to turn it on. So if you don't turn it on, you won't have a location. Um, or if your phone isn't working properly, you may not have a location. That shouldn't usually be the case. Um, but don't worry, if you don't have a location, this is how you find it. If you're on the computer, your screen will first look like the top picture. And if you're on your um, smartphone, your, your screen will first look like the, the top picture on the right. So basically what the goal is, is you want those the, the set of crosshairs over the location where you're pretty sure you saw your species. The center of the circle should be where you think your exact location was. And then basically the, dot, the perimeter of the circle just encompasses all the area where it possibly could have been. So for example, if I was in Burlington and I was in the parking lot of Echo Lake Aquarium and I saw a squirrel and I took a picture of it and I put it on iNaturalist and needed to add my, op my location. Um, if I remembered that I was in the parking lot of Echo Lake Aquarium, I could make the center of my circle, um, this point right here, I could make the center of the circle exactly where I thought I was standing in that parking lot and then make the outside of the circle the general shape of the parking lot. Um, however, if all I could remember is I was in Burlington when I saw the squirrel, I could make the outside of the circle the size of the whole city of Burlington. Um, and I realize that's a pretty big circle, but it's more important to have the spot where you were somewhere located in the circle than to have your circle really small and specific, but not have the spot anywhere in there. Because basically what this is doing is it's helping other people um, and scientists and other researchers who then go to use your observation understand where you were. So you want that to be as accurate as possible. So once you have the circle set to where you want it to be, for the computer, there's an update observations button at the bottom that you click and that'll send you back to your observation. Or on your phone, there'll be an arrow in the top left corner and that will send you back to your observation. And once your date and location are filled in, you get to do the next part, which I, you can start with this. I usually save this till the middle of the end because I think by figuring out what the species is is super fun. So I'll say, hold on to that for a minute. But so to figure out what your species is, you'll type species either in the box that says species name for your computer, or you'll type in um, the what did you see box on your smartphone. And basically when you click in either of those boxes, you'll get screens that look like this, where they have a bunch of suggestions. The top one will say, we're pretty sure it's in this broader category. For the computer version, it's saying family right now. For the mobile version, it's saying genus. And then it's giving me a bunch of suggestions for species. So if you look to the left um, at the computer, it's saying American mink, Northern, North American river otter, Eurasian otter. Um, and a good way to narrow down, if you're not 100% sure already which species you're seeing, a good way to narrow it down is to look at the green text at the bottom of each species, where it says visually similar slash seen nearby or just one or the other. And so, for example, by looking at the Eurasian otter, I know that's probably not it because although it says visually similar, it's not seen nearby. So I know that's probably not going to be it. And so you can use some of that language there to help you narrow it down. Um, another great tool that I've highlighted using red in these um, mobile version is there are these buttons that allow you to compare your photo, um, the photo of your observation to a photo of a species. So for example, if I clicked on those arrows, it would show side by side my photo with pictures of Western um, terrestrial garter snakes and common garter snakes, um, which would allow me to look and see how similar they appear. Um, and so using these different methods, I can try to narrow it down to which species I'm pretty confident it is. But if I'm looking at the list of species and I really just don't think any of them are that accurate, it's okay to stick with the broader suggestion, um, the genus or the family that the AI is providing me. It's okay to stay with those because other people will likely come along and offer their own identifications and they may know more than me and be able to um, make the observation or make the identification. However, sometimes the AI doesn't always work perfectly. Um, in this example here, 
it actually got the first one right. It is a white-headed woodpecker, but you'll notice the next option is striped skunk, Virginia possum, bear, um, and the option below the black bear was actually a panda, which wasn't even on the same continent. I was in California. So you, you, the AI can get confused sometimes. So if this happened and white-headed woodpecker wasn't even on the list, I could put in bird if I didn't know it was a white-headed woodpecker. Or if I didn't even know it was a bird that I was seeing, I could just put in animal. And so it's okay to put in these really broad categories, even though it might feel like cheating in some ways, because it'll actually help other users be able to find your observations and help you with identifying them. Um, because you can put in unknown, but the problem with putting in um, unknown, or I don't know what this species is, is that it'll often get lost in this gray space of iNaturalist where um, no one can really find it. So even just putting in plant or animal or fungi will help other people be able to find it better and be able to help um, provide an identification for you. So once you have all your information filled in, you can kind of look through the, uh, the boxes that you have. Um, some other ones that we didn't fill in are description or notes. Um, and this is a great place to fill in other things that you noticed about this um, the animal or the plant that you couldn't, that didn't really come through in the picture. So say it was a feature that helped you make a better identification or something about its behavior or appearance that didn't come through in the photo. This is great. These are great ways to include this. Um, another thing to notice is there's an option for the privacy of your observation. So there's location is public or um, on the mobile version, it says location visibility is open. And so this means that anyone who visits your observation will be able to see exactly where you were when you made it. Now, if you want, if you don't want people to know exactly where you were, you can put that your location is obscured, which basically just draws a big rectangle and says that your observation was made somewhere in there. Um, and finally, if you don't want anyone to know even close to where you were, you can set it as private and no one will be able to see your location. The downside of private and obscured though, is that it's harder for people who are trying to use your observation as data for projects um, and, re and um, papers to be able to know where it was, um, where the observation was made. So sometimes it makes the data less usable. Um, and another important uh, thing to note on these pages is this box underneath location um, where you can check captive or cultivated. And this is important, say, for example, if I had photographed that American mink in a zoo, I would want to mark, I would want to mark captive or cultivated just to let people know that it wasn't a wild animal. And this is important because marking that will help researchers know that they need to treat the data slightly differently. Um, finally, there are categories such as tags, projects, and fields, um, some of which Zach might touch on in a little bit. And uh, for now, we're just going to pass over them, um, trying to keep this simple. So once you have the information set to how you want it, you can either hit the submit observation button on your computer, or for your smartphone, you hit the check mark that's circled in red in the top right corner of the screen. And then um, your observation will be uploaded and you'll be ready to go. So at this moment, I'm going to pause for questions. Um, I believe Zach's been watching the, the chat. So yeah, we'll take some questions now. Yeah, we haven't gotten any questions yet in the chat, but um, we've got a few moments to answer questions. So if you have one, you can either send it in the chat. I just got one from David, or um, you can unmute yourself um, and ask a question. Um, uh, David asks, on some observations, it records the wrong time. How do I change this? Mm. That's a good question. I would say if it's recording the wrong time and you're taking the pictures through your phone, I would, I guess I would check to make sure, I would check your settings to see how the time is um, set up in your settings. I know at least for location, different apps will um, make modifications to the location that comes in for them. Um, but you can, I believe you can go in and change the time manually. Um, and I don't think the time is quite as important as the date. So as long as you have, you know, a general bar ballpark like evening, morning, midday, um, it should be okay if it's not down to the last minute. But yeah, I would check um, phone settings and then um, if that doesn't seem to give you any answers to 
um, just change them manually. Um, Richard is asking a question about uh, photos that aren't strong enough to really identify down to a species. Um, and wondering if there are other ways to see details about a species more than just photos, names, and what is visually similar or seen nearby, as iNaturalist calls it. Hmm. So I think for photos that are hard to identify, they're definitely still worth including. Um, it, sometimes I know that um, people will use different um, photo editing software to try to clarify photos just to help with an identification. Um, another one is if you have a photo that's really um, not clear enough to you know, help someone make an observation, an identification, um, providing a, a verbal description of what you saw in the um, in in the description or the notes section can be really helpful because sometimes people will be able to um, based on the features that they can pick out in the photo and then based on how you describe it they can make an identification um, and I mean sometimes there are photos that end up there that really can't be identified past a certain point but they're still helpful because um, it's hard to know whether in a little while if they'll be able to be identified more clearly. One thing that I have seen folks do in the past um, that uh, is not recommended is to go online and find a photo of whatever they observed that looks similar. So say I saw a blue jay in my backyard, but I wasn't able to take it, uh, a picture of it. Um, a, a person may uh, go get a picture of a blue jay from online and add it to their iNaturalist. And really any media that you are putting on iNaturalist needs to be um, associated with the, the date, time, and location um, where you observed it. So if, if that media, um, say I, I saw a blue jay at my house, and then I take a picture of a blue jay two days later, and I wanna add it to that observation I made of a blue jay, um, here at my home, um, really, that's those are two different observations, and that that media should really stay with the date, time, and location where you observed it. And and David asks about adding recordings. You can add um, audio and video to your iNaturalist observations. Um, right now, they don't. Um, you can add sorry audio and pictures to your iNaturalist observations. Right now, they don't allow adding video, um, and I think that's mainly a, a storage thing um, on their part. If you have a video that you'd like to add, what they recommend is that you take a screenshot of the video that shows the organism that you're trying to identify, and then post in the comments section um, or, or the description section a link to either Flickr or YouTube or somewhere that other folks can access that video. Any other questions before we switch um, and I talk a little bit um, more about the, the, the inner workings of iNaturalist? All right, awesome, thank you, Emily. Uh, now that you all are, um, are comfortable and familiar with getting started and making your first iNaturalist observations, uh, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about what happens behind the scenes and how you can um, make the most of using the platform. And so once you've signed up for iNaturalist, um, when you log in, you'll come to this home screen or dashboard, it's also called. And what this shows is um, some information about your profile, so you can edit your profile. You can click on a link that shows you all of your observations in the list, or even a calendar that shows you your observations by date. You can make different lists of your observations. So if you wanna make a list of all the observations you made in a certain place, you can do that. You can even um, keep your own nature journal um, right through iNaturalist and add observations to that. 
Um, and then there's a link that can show you all of you the projects that you're a part of here as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, shortly. You'll also be able to um, see uh, if you follow other users, you'll be able to see um, what observations have been made by people that you follow. So if you click on the observations, this is the one I find myself going to most often, um, you get this screen. This screen shows you all the observations you've made um, in the world. You can sort it by the date and time you um, observed it or the date and time that you added the observation. You can also search by species. So if I wanna see all the observations I've made of um, mink, I can put that in there, or I can add mink and then the location, say Vermont, and I'll see all the mink observations I have for Vermont. Then there's also this other filters box. And if you open up that filters box, you'll find a lot more ways to search through your observations. You can tag, you can um, sort observations by the date and time you observed it, or by a range of dates, or by a month, or by a group of organisms. So say I wanna see all the plants that I observed in May, you can do that. So it's just another tool for going through and finding observations or sets of observations that you've made. Another way that observations are sorted in iNaturalist is uh, by projects. So projects are a group of observations that all have a purpose together. Anyone can make a project within iNaturalist. You can make your own project. Um, and you can also join projects um, that have to do with um, all sorts of different things in different places. So you may, um, here's a great example of a, a project down at the bottom right, the Burlington Vermont Mammal Tracking Project, where they're tracking the movement of mammals through Burlington, Vermont. So if you see um, an animal track in Burlington, you can join that project and add it there. Or say you observed a bird in Colorado, you can join that project and add that observation to it. The people who um, administer these projects, the people who, who um, run them, can set parameters on them. So say you want to join the Birds of Colorado project, in order to add observations to that, it must be a bird species and it must be within the bounds of Colorado. So you, it won't let you add observations to that project if it doesn't meet those criteria. We have a project at North Branch Nature Center where we um, are trying to document all the observations on iNaturalist that were made on our property. So we were able to draw a shape around the North Branch Nature Center property and any time an iNaturalist observation falls within that shape, it's added to our project. I'll show you some more projects later that are in our area that you may want to join. You can also search for projects, um, which is a cool way to discover uh, what's going on in your area. So I recommend you know, going into the projects page, searching for Vermont, and see if there are any that you might um, want to participate in or search near you. If you're submitting to a project, you may get prompted to fill out an observation field. Observation fields allow project administrators to collect more data other than what is regularly submitted. So these have a great range in them. There are hundreds of different observation fields and you can see there a list of various different observation fields that, that are, are quite unique and have, have a big range to them. Here's an example from a, our amphibian road crossing project where um, we are asking, uh, we have had folks who are taking uh, photos while participating in our project to add them on iNaturalist, but they are correlated with a three digit site number. So if someone is gonna to submit to this project, they input their three digit number that they know that uh, corresponds with their site. That way we can sort through all those observations. So that's an observation field. Um, you may get prompted to fill one of those out based on a project that you're joining. 
There were also annotations. Annotations are, are very similar to observation fields, but these go across iNaturalist. They're not um, project specific. Um, and these have to do, there are only a few right now. iNaturalist will probably add more in the future, but right now they have to do with plant phenology and sex and uh, animal life stage, whether it's alive or dead and it's sex as well. So you can see um, here are two different examples of spotted salamanders and you can choose when you submit it to select what life stage it's in. You can also leave those blank if you don't know. I wanna talk for just a couple minutes about how iNaturalist figures out the quality of a piece of, of data. And when they, they talk about data quality assessment, and it really has to do with how accurate and complete an observation is, um, because when uh, scientists and researchers are using the iNaturalist data, they want to make sure that it's, it's true data. And so a verifiable observation has to have a date, it has to have a, a, a georeference location. It has to have photos or sounds, and it can't be of something that's captive or cultivated. So you'll see there are different grades of observations. The um, first grade you'll get when you submit something is needs identification. So you'll see this yellow banner, and that's if you've identified something or perhaps no, uh, perhaps you haven't even identified something yet, but it requires two other people, two other users to um, agree with you on an ID. And so that's how iNaturalist works as a community um, to uh, allow um, for scientific grade observations. So even though you may not know, if enough people are able to agree on an identification, it will allow that to be used for research. So when you first submit something, it'll have this yellow banner that says needs ID. Unfortunately, if you don't have any media associated with it, if there's no photo or audio, it will always have this gray casual banner next to it. That can never be used for science. There's no way to verify what you saw. Now, sometimes I still submit casual observations. So say I saw uh, an animal that I don't usually see often, maybe a black bear near my home, and I wanna keep track of that. If I didn't get a photo or an audio recording of it, I can still put that on there. It just won't ever be used uh, for science. The research grade banner is really what you want to get to, this green banner here. And the way that works is by having users come together in agreement about an observation. And to be considered research grade, it has to meet this two thirds mark, where two thirds of the people who have identified it have identified it as the same organism. So you can hear, see down below I'll hide that, Oop. You can see down below here where uh, a organism has been identified both as a two-line salamander and as an Eastern newt. So because those don't agree, it hasn't reached the two-thirds mark to say that either one is correct. And so what iNaturalist has done is say that even though we don't know if it's, there is an agreement about what kind of salamander it is, there is agreement that's a sa that it's a salamander. So for right now, it will live on iNaturalist as a salamander and it's research grade as a salamander. If other people come along down the line and agree that it's one of these species or the other, it may hit that two thirds bar to be identified as one of those species, but right now it's just a salamander. I wanna talk a, a little bit more about the geo privacy that uh, Emily was talking about earlier and just how it works. And um, when you're submitting something, no matter whether you put it as open, obscured or private, iNaturalist will always keep those coordinates 
somewhere in their system. So there's no way to submit something without a specific location. If you leave it open, everyone will be able to see right where you saw that thing. That's great for research. It's great for other users to be able to maybe find something um, that's exciting and that they want to go see. Um, if you want to keep it obscured, so perhaps you're submitting something unique that's in a private place um, and you don't want other folks to go observe it. So say you have a really interesting um, butterfly in your backyard and, and you're worried that other people might try and come see it, you can hit the obscured button. And what that does is it, it creates a, a rectangle um, and then shows the observation as a random point within that rectangle. The true coordinates are somewhere in that rectangle so people will be able to know that somewhere around, somewhere in that shape, this observation was made, but they won't be able to see exactly where it was. And then by selecting private, you are, uh, you are um, taking the map away completely. So no users will be able to see the map. The only people who will be able to see where this is on a map are, are you who made the observation and project curators. So if you've added it to a project, the people who curate that project will be able to see it. There's also a feature called trusted users. So you can, in your profile, select other users as trusted users. Maybe you're working together on a certain project. Maybe you're trying to do some research um, and you are together adding observations. You can select them as a trusted user so that they'll also be able to see the location of something you submit if it's uh, private. So just going over some things you, you should submit to iNaturalist. Uh, definitely submit your common species. Um, it may seem silly to submit something over and over. There are lots of submissions of black capped chickadees and uh, white pines on iNaturalist in Vermont. Um, but those are really important observations to perhaps show that the range or the seasonality of something that's common is really changing. Rare species are super important. For some rare species, iNaturalist will automatically obscure where that was. So in Vermont, there are some species that are, are listed as rare, and iNaturalist does take information from the state. So if Vermont changes the listing, um, the, rare, um, the rare threatened or endangered listing of a species, uh, iNaturalist will get that information and they will change how they obscure those species um, uh, in in relation to what the state decides on that. Um, but it's still important to have in there, and even though it's getting obscured, researchers will be able to access those data. Animal sign are perfectly acceptable. So if you have um, a feather, if you have a track of an animal, if you have animal scat, um, those are all perfectly fine things to add. Um, and people can uh, corroborate those on iNaturalist too. Invasive species are also really important to add to iNaturalist. There are some uh, communities that are tracking the spread of invasive species using iNaturalist. So those are really important data to add as well. And any part of a plant um, can be added. So if you find the seeds of, of a plant, you can add those as well. Some things you definitely want to stay away from adding, um, captive and domestic animals. Um, those don't really have a research value on iNaturalist. Um, and so we ask folks not to add those. That's different from feral animals that are perhaps establishing um, a presence in the wild on their own. Um, these are, we're really talking about pets and farm animals that should not be added to iNaturalist. Fossils as well. Um, they were living at some point, but not any time recently. 
um, people. It's it's lovely to see other other folks, but iNaturalist is is not tracking where people are. Um, cultivated plants, um, similar to farm animals, it's not um, it's it's not data that are are tracking wild living things, um, and non living things also don't belong on iNaturalist. Some tips about making observations. So when you are going to submit some media, uh, it may be helpful to try and get, you know, as close to you as you can um, in your photo. So you can see in the photo on the left, um, it's, a, it's a bigger picture. Obviously, they didn't want to get physically closer to this animal, but you can get the picture closer to it by cropping some of that out. Um, and that's helpful for folks both who are going to try and identify something and just in terms of storing all of the data um, in iNaturalist. Below here, you're seeing uh, a, an observation that has a couple different organisms in here. And so what you can do is identify one of the organisms and then hit duplicate um, there. And when you duplicate it, it will allow you to change the name of the other or of the other organism and add it right there. So right now there's no way to, in the same observation, tag multiple organisms. You have to make individual observations for each one. But you can do that pretty easily using the duplicate function. And just a few other pointers. Here's a picture of a few different, a couple different organisms in one photo. The, mainly in this photo are showing long-tailed ducks with their characteristic long tails, but on the back side of those, there are two horned grebes that are kind of hard to see, and they're also sleeping, so they have their heads tucked in. And so what I did um, using iPhoto was to add um, a, uh, a, a text box and a couple arrows so that when people are going through iNaturalist, and trying to corroborate this identification, they can quickly see what I'm talking about. They don't have to do much searching through the photo to know where the horn grebes are. Another thing you can do is add historical photos. So this is kind of historical, it's not that old. This is um, me in a bug box back in 2001 full of monarch caterpillars. So when I started um, getting really excited about iNaturalist, I went through family photo albums and uh, added lots of different things. Um, luckily, I, I had a pretty good idea where this was, and I have the date, and we know what organism or organisms are in this, so I could add that um, on there as well. So that's a fun project. Um, perhaps to go through old photos, uh, even in albums, and see if you have things that you can add to iNaturalist. And where did the data go? So the data that um, are on iNaturalist, it's a, it's a project that's, that's housed at the California Academy of Sciences. So they're, they're collecting all these data, they're storing it, and then um, when it reaches that research grade level, it goes into uh, a program called GBIF or GBIF, and that allows scientists to um, look at iNaturalist data as well as data from other, uh, other databases that are all collected together um, and, and really see uh, big sets of, and, and make, uh, make inferences about trends. And so the, I, the Vermont At Atlas of Life is this amazing project that um, Vermont Center for Eco Studies started um, trying to document every living thing in the state. And iNaturalist has been uh, tremendously helpful in, in doing that. I wanna show you a, a few different projects. Here's a really cool project. You know, it's not, these projects are not just um, folks going out and taking pictures of what's in their backyards, but this was a collection um, in a museum of different arthropods, and they were able to digitize those. So volunteers went in and took pictures of all the different specimens, and then um, other volunteers are uploading them to iNaturalist. So rather than just living in a box, these um, specimens are able to be used uh, to maybe figure out some trends in, in populations over time. 
that's a, a pretty big picture one something that's a little bit more local is a project like this waterbury wild which tracks all the living things in the town of waterbury vermont and this allows groups like the waterbury conservation commission to maybe go in and see where certain animals are moving in their community um, and and maybe make some change about uh, transportation infrastructure or perhaps see where all the ash trees are in their community um, to prepare for emerald ash borer. Here's one that North Branch Nature Center was a part of in digitizing uh, the herbarium collection from Green Mountain College, which closed last year. And so photos were taken of all of their um, specimens and put on iNaturalist using the records attached to each specimen. So, you know, if, if something were to happen to a collection, if they're digitized on iNaturalist, those data will always be available, even if something happens to a specimen in the future. Here's just another example of a project, um, Wild Paths, which tracks animal crossings. So this is something that, you know, can go all through the region. And if you see an animal crossing a road, you can add that to this project. So I, I really love projects. There's something that, you know, gets me excited about going on iNaturalist uh, and being a part of a community of folks that are submitting data um, with a specific goal in mind. And I think with that, we'll uh, open it up again to questions from you folks um, and put our contact information there if, if uh, folks want to get a hold of us. Awesome. So we do have at least one question over here, Zach. Um, I wonder if you can speak briefly to the benefits of adding common species. Someone was wondering um, how you decide what species to add and um, whether it's okay to just focus on posting things that you don't know how to identify for, um, versus posting things that you already know what they are. Yeah, I think um, people underestimate the value of tracking common things. Um, you know, something that would be super common is uh, our ash trees. Um, a lot of communities in Vermont planted a ton of ash trees um, as, a, as a normal street tree. And we find ourselves in a position now where we have an invasive species that's coming and communities are working really hard to try and figure out where all their ash trees are. So that's something that is really, uh, is fairly common, but now we're suddenly finding that there's a value in knowing where those are. Similarly, uh, you know, tracking um, changes in, when um, deer are moving around the state or when um, black bears are, are going um, in and out of, of hibernation for the winter. Um, iNaturalist data you know, submitted by users of, of black bears may show changes in, in when they're um, hibernating. Um, so even though there are some really common things, um, you know, there, there can be a benefit to those data. Great. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Zach? Feel free to um, post them in the chat. We're coming up to the end here, but we want to take a few more questions if anyone has any. All right. No new questions coming in. All right. Awesome. Oh, just got one, actually. Oh. Um, someone asking, uh, uh, they submit bird observations to eBird. Is there any overlap? Um, I, a lot of people submit on both platforms. Um, a lot of folks it, who are doing bird research may look in both places. Um, so there may be some data overlap. Um, but I, you know, I submit to both iNaturalist and eBird, um, and there's nothing wrong with doing both. Um, and then just wondering if there's a similar geology program that can identify things like eskers or cairns. That's a great I don't, I don't yeah. know. I want to say I might have heard that there's something like that out there, but I can't think of, um, I can't think of what it's called. Yeah. 
I mean, this is just one citizen science platform. There are tons of different citizen science platforms out there. So, you know, I hope that this just piques your interest and uh, you go looking for some other programs. Oh, so I see. Where on the VC site are the missing beetles? So if you go to, um, it's actually not uh, on our regular VC site. I can um, actually, I'll find the link for you guys real quick. It's on our Vermont Atlas of Life website. Um, and we are having a lady beetle blitz in a couple weeks, a backyard beetle blitz. So if you want to learn more about that, you can visit our website. Um, and here is the link for the lady beetle project. I'm going to put it in the chat box over here and feel free to go there. And if you have any questions, you can email me about it. Awesome. Any, any lingering questions? I'm, I'm happy to answer more questions now or, you know, have folks email me. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for uh, coming. Thank you everyone.